here we are. We're, we, we are recording. Um, okay. So good afternoon and welcome everyone to, I'm just going to start sharing my screen. There you go. To Evidence Synthesis, Systematic Reviews, and You. I'm Katie Hutt. I'm a librarian at AU where I work with faculty, students, and staff at COGAD. And I'm going to turn it over to my co presenter, Clarissa, to introduce herself. All right. Hi, everyone. I am Clarissa. I'm also a librarian here at American. I cover all of the science disciplines in CAS um, and any other science related questions that come from other departments at the university. So today we're going to talk about evidence synthesis, which I'm going to say a lot, and I'm sure we'll stumble over at least a few times. Um, evidence synthesis is an umbrella term that includes systematic reviews as well as other review types. Evidence synthesis, <laughs> evidence synthesis first emerged in uh, the health sciences a couple of decades ago um, as a way to ensure that reviews of studies were as comprehensive as possible so that decisions and policies were evidence-based. And it makes sense why this started in medicine where there are quite literally lives on the line. Um, but in recent years, maybe the last seven, eight, maybe 10 years, depending on the discipline, um, the practice has spread across disciplines. Um, so we're seeing evidence synthesis um, across multiple disciplines uh, these days. So during our presentation, we're going to start by um, giving you a definition of evidence synthesis and um, some of the different research methodologies that encompasses, again, including systematic reviews. So we'll go into the different frameworks, guidelines, and protocols required for systematic reviews. Uh, we'll talk about the process, really walk you through the process, and then we'll discuss some of the ways that the library can help you throughout the process. We are aiming to present for about 75 minutes, and then we'll leave the last 15 minutes for questions. But of course, you can feel free to ask questions uh, throughout the presentation. You can raise your hand and unmute yourself, um, or you can put them in the chat. All right, so we wanted to start with a poll um, to see how familiar our audience is with evidence synthesis. So first I can, oh, there we go. All right, it looks like everyone has participated. So I'll go ahead and end the poll and I'll share the results. Thank you. So it looks like we have a pretty good mix um, of experiences, a big, a big range of experience from people who are totally new to this to people who have published systematic reviews. So for those who have published a systematic review or in the process already, um, You'll probably know quite a bit of this, uh, but we did want to make sure everyone was on the same page. Uh, but thank you for letting us know where you are. So what is evidence synthesis? Um, I really liked this definition. I actually got it from chat GPT, but I thought it did a really, I thought it was a good explanation. So it's the process of um, collection, analyzing, and integrating data from multiple sources in a systematic way. It involves rigorous and transparent approaches to identifying, selecting, and evaluating the information that will be included in the review. And the goal of a system of evidence synthesis, rather, is often to provide, um, or the goal is always to provide a comprehensive and unbiased overview of the existing evidence on a particular topic which can then inform decision-making. So it is often used to inform like policy change or policy-making. So there are lots of different 
types of evidence synthesis methodologies, again, including systematic reviews, right? Um, Grant and Booth published an uh, impactful article back in 2009 called uh, Typology of Reviews that described 14 different review types, as well as their strengths and weaknesses. Um, so I'm just going to read few, uh, through uh, a few of them uh, that we thought were important to highlight. Um, so the first is the narrative literature review, which provides an overview of the literature, um, but considering its development over time, it does not use any quantitative methods. So this would be most akin to, um, you know, what, what our students are sometimes doing in their classes, depending on the class, or what you would read, uh, you know, in the beginning of, let's say, a scholarly article. Um, then we have a scoping review, could also be called a systematic map or an evidence gap map. And this looks at the themes in research. It could be trends, gaps, but looking at sort of the lay of the land of the research overall, where the research currently is. Um, then of course we have our systematic reviews, which we're gonna get into in greater detail. Um, these use rigorous methods for search and selection, and they will often answer a question like what works or what does the research say, what the research says. And then other methodologies um, that you may have heard about or you may have come across would be the rapid review, which um, can sort of compromise uh, precision and comprehensiveness, but in order to uh, get the review out very quickly. Um, I, I think we probably saw some of this happening during COVID because, you know, again, lives were on the line and we needed to make sense of the information really, really quickly. Um, living reviews are continually updated. And then an umbrella review is a review, it's a systematic review of other systematic reviews. Um, so we thought it was important to kind of talk about some of the different methodologies other than systematic reviews because the term systematic review has gotten really popular as of late. Um, so you may think, okay, I have to, I have to do a systematic review. Um, when in fact, something like a scoping review may better serve you and the research you need to do and would be a less cumbersome undertaking. Um, so we did want to kind of just have a sense of what the different methodology types are. And then, oh, great, thanks, Clarissa. So the next slide we're going to look at is this um, decision tree from Cornell, which we like a lot, which takes us through um, if you need to do a systematic review. So I just opened it on my screen. Yeah, it's a little bigger here. So these are some of the questions you can ask yourself before embarking on this uh, or to tell you what type of review might be right for you. Do you want to gather all the evidence on a particular research topic? So if the answer is no, um, then that probably leads you toward doing something like a, a literature review. If the answer is yes, do you have three or more people to work on the review? Uh, if the answer is no, um, you may not be doing a systematic review. Uh, those review types do require a multi-person team to make sure that uh, the article screening process is unbiased. If you do have three or more people to work with the review, to work with you on the review, do you have 12 to 18 months to complete the review? If the answer is no, you may be looking at a rapid review. If the answer is yes, you can then ask yourself, do you have a broad topic or multiple research questions? If the answer is yes, that may mean you're doing a scoping review. If the answer is no, you can then ask yourself, do you want to review other published systematic reviews on your topic? If you do want to review other systematic reviews, maybe you're doing an umbrella review. If no, is your research question well formulated? Um, if no, that's going to be something that you'll need to work on before starting the systematic review. If it is, all signs point to doing a systematic review, uh, but then you can also ask yourself and your team, are you going to use statistical methods to um, evaluate or summarize the results? If yes, then you may be doing um, a meta-analysis or you could do a meta-analysis. Um, if you don't want to do that, you don't need to do a meta-analysis. 
Um, so we like this, it's just kind of a way to frame how to think about which review type is gonna make the most sense. Um, I also found, we found a tool called Write Review, which walks you through um, the type of review that you can do. Um, and then Fletcher, I think it, it's gonna put that in the chat. I'm sorry if I didn't send that to you before. Um, and then we have the link. Um, we can, we can share the, we can, yes, we can, we can come up with a list of all of our, um, all of our sources. Um, or if you prefer, you can open them right now. They're in the chat and you can bookmark them. Um, so whichever way works better. But um, thank you, Gavin, for that question. All right, I'm gonna jump back into my slides. So let's talk, let's talk about systematic reviews. This is why most of us are here, right? Um, so systematic reviews will often answer a question of whether an intervention is effective. So does this intervention work in this population? Um, is there sufficient evidence? Oftentimes the question format will be something like, what is the effect of intervention X on population Y in achieving Z outcome? So it's kind of like those, often it's those like three parts. Um, sometimes systematic reviews are limited to certain types of study designs. Um, for example, random randomized control trials. Um, they always include a comprehensive, transparent, and reproducible search strategy um, to ensure that all relevant literature is included. So that is a, that is a must. Um, they have specific study inclusion and exclusion criteria, another must. Uh, and they always need to include a risk of bias and quality assessment. Um, this is looking at every article included in the review for bias. Um, and sometimes this assessment is um, included as a table in the final, a final manuscript. And sometimes, again, they will include a quantitative analysis of the finding. This would be a meta-analysis, but they don't always. So you don't have to have a meta-analysis in your systematic review. You do, however, need to have a systematic review in your meta-analysis, that makes sense. A little more detail here. Um, well, often we are looking at questions of effectiveness. Um, they can use, they can be used to answer other types of research questions, such as how is a construct defined and measured, um, questions about rates, trends, and prevalence, whether things are correlated, and uh, cause and effect questions. So a specific example of a systematic review question would be, what is the effect of mindfulness practice for college students on mental health and well-being outcomes? So again, this follows the same format. What is the effect of intervention X? So this would be mindfulness practice as the intervention on population Y, a population is college students um, in achieving Z outcomes, and that would be um, well-being. And while we're talking about questions and sort of how to set up your systematic review questions, um, Clarissa is going to jump in with some information about frameworks that you can use. Okay, great. Thank you, Katie. Um, just to pop in for a second and talk about frameworks, which are a way to frame your research question. Katie mentioned about having an X, a Y, and a Z. There are multiple different ideas of how you can frame your questions all fit under a systematic review. This first one is the most common. It is PICO. So it is population or patient intervention, comparison, and outcome. This is most useful or used for quantitative research questions, particularly those in health sciences. An example would be an infant diagnosed with NEC. That's the population. What is the effect of early entry feeding intervention on NEC recurrence compared to late entry feeding? There's your comparison. And then the outcome is what that question is. What is the outcome? Um, similarly, you have PEO, 
for PO, which is population exposure outcome. These are more useful for qualitative research questions. And once again, that's going to be um, like, what are the daily lived experiences of mothers with postnatal depression? Mothers with postnatal depression is your population. Um, the ex or mothers is the population. Postnatal depression is the exposure, which is a little funky to think about. Um, and then outcome is what are those daily lived experiences? Um, so just a little different for qualitative research questions. Um, there are over 25 different frameworks. Some other common ones are SPIDER or SPICE or Eclipse. Um, so really finding a framework that helps match your question um, is really helpful because this is a way to think about your question. And as Katie has noted, your question is a very important aspect for the systematic review. If your question isn't for a systematic review, then you'd need a different kind of methodology. Thank you, Clarissa. So we looked at systematic reviews and what those questions look like. So we're just going to do a comparison to scoping reviews, and um, which are also called systematic maps. Um, so a scoping review can be a preliminary assessment of the potential size and scope of available of the available literature. And it's often done in advance of a systematic review. Um, you would do a scoping review to see, do we need to do a systematic review? So it can be almost like a first step. Um, can you know make the case for, for doing a systematic review or not, um, or the case against it. Um, the research, your research question for a scoping review is going to be broader than a systematic review. Um, you still want it well defined, but it can be um, a broader question. Um, it often includes uh, multiple type, multiple types of studies, um, sometimes not, and it will include a uh, thematic analysis, um, tables, maps, but there's no synthesis of the of the studies per se. Um, and it typically does not include a risk of bias or quality assessment as you would find in a systematic review. Um, so oftentimes the scoping review question is looking at what interventions are used to address outcome X in population Y, um, what are the characteristics of the literature on intervention X in setting Y. Um, so these questions we can tell are a lot broader. So what intervention, what are the characteristics? Um, we're not looking at specific effects as we often are in a systematic review. Um, so an example would be, what is the extent and range of research literature on the impact of social media use on mental health among adolescents, right? So we're looking at extent and range of research. That is a good clue. Those two words are good clues that and what we're looking at is a scoping review question. And now we have a quick poll um, to see what we have two questions, and we would love audience participation in deciding are these, um, is this a systematic review question or a scoping review question? So take a look um, and let us know thoughts for your answers in the poll. All right, wait a minute. Um, if everyone wants to participate, you can, if we don't want to, we probably have some good audience participation already. Um, and yes, so, so what machine learning methods have been used for mental health clinical practice and research? Um, this would be a scoping review. Um, we can tell it is, it's pretty broad. We're looking at, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a pretty broad, question here. 
Um, and then the second one, how effective are different methods for improving student achievement scores in algebra? Um, we can tell we're looking at the effect of an intervention on a specific population. Um, uh, so intervention Y, population X, I think I just mixed those up. Uh, population Z, intervention X on population Y and outcome Z. So we can see that the kind of like three part of that question. So that is a much more specific question, which would lend itself to a systematic review. Thank you everyone for your participation. And we'll just to review some other types of methodologies that are gaining popularity um, as of late would be the living systematic review, um, which is continually updated um, to incorporate new evidence as it becomes available. Um, in addition to the rapid review, which um, is gonna omit some of the processes that you would find in a systematic review um, to produce information in a shorter time frame. Um, so often with like, in terms of like making policy change, um, often those are leaning on rapid reviews just because the systematic review can take again, a year to 18 months uh, to finish. And sometimes we don't have that kind of time. And with that, we've talked about kind of had an introduction to evidence synthesis and the different types of methodologies that encompasses. Um, we're gonna get much more specific uh, into systematic reviews and I'm gonna let Clarissa start with reproducibility and replicability. All right, great, thanks Katie. Okay, so we've talked a lot about our questions and what all these different things are. I'm going to start talking a lot about protocols and guidelines and all of these rules. And before I talk about all of that, I want to have another sidebar and explain why we have all of these rules. Systematic reviews and evidence synthesis are a methodology of performing research. And as a result, part of the scientific process is we want things to be reproducible and repli replicable. Um, other people should be able to use your results, um, or they should be able to duplicate your results using the same materials and procedures. Um, demonstrating this also shows that you're not cherry picking your studies, um, you're doing everything. Um, and then sharing this information could allow for an extension or the potential for a living systematic review, which is constantly um, being changed and updated. So next slide. This is why we pre-register our protocol. Later I'm going to talk about what a protocol is. This is why we do one of those and why you pre-register it. So once you have your research plan, you're going to register your research plan before actually gathering your data. Doing this is a way to prevent hypothesizing after results are known, sometimes called harking. Um, we acknowledge and all researchers know preliminary searching is necessary. We don't want to do too much searching where you already have a very strong idea of what the outcome is. Um, you're going to do exploratory research to make sure there's enough on this topic to produce some research you're not searching to confirm what you already know. So your preliminary searching is hypothesis generating. It is not hypothesis testing. You're going to pre-register before you do all of the searching. Okay, next slide. When you're writing up the research methods section, they should be transparent and reproducible. As an example, and this is a very tiny example of searching, your first search would be EXP infants, um, searching for anything in that subject heading. Next search would be babies or a baby with a wild card, with an or, and then infants, wild cards, truncations. TW here stands for title words, so you're searching all of this. And then you combine search one and two to get your results. This level of specificity 
and writing down how you're searching is part of that process of documentation in order to be as transparent and reproducible as possible. That being said, next slide. Pre-registering does not inherently mean your research is reproducible, just like being transparent doesn't mean it's reproducible. This is because every library or every institution's library subscribes to different databases, um, amounts of content within those databases, back files. Um, people could have done different levels of hand searching, calling on listservs. So just because you explain your research doesn't mean it's reproducible and as that just end of sentence. Just because you explain it doesn't mean it's going to be as reproducible as we want it to be. But we do these things to hit the goal. OK, so I previously mentioned frameworks when we were talking about questions. Frameworks are the ways of thinking about your question. Next, I'm going to talk about guidelines and protocols, all kinds of rules. We love them. Next slide. So there are two different kinds of research guidelines. You're going to have conducting guidelines and reporting guidelines. Conducting guidelines, next slide, are the playbook for doing evidence synthesis research. These guidelines are the ones that give you guidance and information on inclusion and exclusion criteria, best practices for your screening process, how to perform the data extraction. Conducting guidelines are the handbook for the methodology of systematic reviews. Um, a major one is the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews of Interventions. It is available online. The library catalog also links to it. Um, this is a major handbook. It provides all different kinds of information, and you are free to view as much of it as you want or need. I refer to it often. Um, similarly, there's the Joanna Briggs Institute, which has its own manuals, um, and they just kind of do that. Those are conducting guidelines. So I mentioned those, and then next we have reporting guidelines. And reporting guidelines are the list of items researchers need to transparently report and document in their IMRAD, abstracts, appendix, and supplemental documents. IMRAD stands for the Intro, Methods, Results, and Discussion section of your article. Um, so the reporting guideline is going to be very specific, and it's going to tell you exactly what you need to include and write down. The most common one is PRISMA, which stands for the Preferred Reporting Items for Systematic Reviews and Meta-Analyses. Most journals provide that um, or prefer it. Each journal has their own requirements. Um, other reporting guidelines include the Messier, M-E-C-C-I-R, which is Methodological Expectations of the Campbell Collaboration Intervention, reviews. There is also a messier with just one C in it. Very confusing. Two different documents, but basically the same acronym. Um, ROSES is an environmental science specific reporting guideline. Um, and then JARS Quant is the journal article standards for quantitative research design. Um, and those tend to be the standards for like the American Psychological Association. There are plenty of other guidelines. If you don't have a discipline specific one, Prisma is most likely to be your best bet. But of course, also pay attention to what the journal you are aiming to publish in requires if they require it. Um, another link on this tab is the Equator Network. We can fix the link in a second, because if Katie goes in, we're going to lose our slides again. Um, the Equator Network is trying to organize all of these different reporting guidelines. However, um, 
they still tend to be a lot of the health science ones are there for now because that's where the industry has been for the longest time. Several benefits to having reporting guidelines include having better reader understanding, and then it increases your likelihood for replication by other reporters and researchers because you're listing everything and it kind of standardizes how you should be doing this. Um, okay, so next I have some different examples. I need again. That's a weird looking link. Okay, but if it's not working, we'll say, share it later or you can Google Prisma, it'll pop up. Um, but next slide, please, Katie. Great. The conducting and reporting guidelines, some of them are the same document as we see the messier with one C or two Cs um, are both conducting and reporting guidelines, whereas there are also documents that are separate. So just Joanna Briggs, HRQ, the Cochrane Handbook, all conducting guidelines, reporting guidelines, or Prisma and all of its extensions, Jars Quant, Roses, that environmental science one, Mooses is another one. There's all different kinds of them and they can be discipline specific, but once again, Prisma tends to be the, the standard. Uh, next slide is an example of Prisma. It's very tiny, I'm sorry, but what I'm showing is how specific these checklists are, where it tells you exactly what should be in your title and exactly what should be in your abstract and introduction, what should be in your methods. It is very explicit on what should be there. It's quite literally a checklist. And I think it's great. In addition to that, Prisma also has a flow diagram. And as you're working, you should be filling out this flow diagram. This diagram is just another way to document and organize as you're going through your research, you're searching, where you're going to list how many documents you get from each database that you search. Um, for each database that you do, and then you're going to list how many records you deduplicated, so then how many you have left. Um, and we're talking about all of this later, but really the flow diagram is where you going where you are going to list out all of the extra information. So in theory, you wouldn't lose a single article without explaining why it dropped from your study. Okay, next are some things to consider when selecting your guidelines. Most important is you want to pay attention to your review type. A lot of these are specific to systematic reviews because that's the major method. There is a Prisma S or a scoping review, so you can follow that reporting guideline as well. Um, many others have different kinds of reporting and conducting guidelines. I mentioned some specific for like the APA or environmental sciences, certain disciplines have their own guidelines that you should pay attention to. Different kinds of populations may have different guidelines. Journal requirements may be different. Um, so it's attention to pay it. It is important to pay attention to that. And finally, certain collaborative networks might have their own expectations and requirements, such as the Campbell Network, um, the Campbell Collaborative, which is a, another organization similar to but different than Cochrane. Okay, one more activity for us. When should you select reporting guidelines? At the beginning or the end? Using your reaction button, raise your hand if you think it's at the beginning. And then don't raise your hand if you think it's at the end. Oh. 
Okay, great, everyone. Thanks for participating. You should select your reporting guidelines at the beginning, um, not at the end, because like I mentioned, we're going to be publishing a protocol before we get started. So you need to know what you're going to report and how you're going to do your search beforehand. Great, okay. So I mentioned all of these rules and requirements and we technically haven't even started doing research yet. So next, let's talk about protocols and protocol registration. Next slide. Unless you two have actual questions. Okay, so protocols and protocol registration. Next slide. A protocol is like a roadmap. It's going to list out how you plan on doing your research so you're able to get where you're going. Your protocol will state your rationale, your hypothesis, and your planned methodology. Once again, it is very important that your protocol is created a priori. I was told I said it wrong last time, and now I don't know how I said it, but I hope I said it right. Um, and then the protocol needs to be registered and shared for transparency, because we mentioned transparency is important. Protocol, great question. We'll get to that when I talk about where to register your protocol. It's your well-developed research plan. It establishes that your group is the people doing this research. It kind of says like, hey, we have dibs. Um, it increases your potential communication with other interested individuals, and it may decrease the number of studies that are all working on the same thing. Okay, so next slide. When writing your protocol, there is rules for how much detail you need. PRISMA P stands for the protocol, um, is one place where you can find information about that, as well as Campbell and Cochrane handbooks both have information about how much detail, as well as a article about best practices for doing this for scoping review. The general thought is you want to be right in the middle between too detailed and not detailed enough. You want to explain some of the big things, your inclusion and exclusion criteria, your hypothesis, the main idea of your methods, but you don't want to provide so much information because as we know, research does change and evolve a little bit. So you also want to include a little wiggle room for flexibility. So following these documents and their guidance is best practice. Okay. So I mentioned they have these um, lists and information for different protocols. On the next slide, I have a list of different templates. You're not required to do this on your own. I mentioned Prisma P, which is a template for um, protocols. Prospero is another protocol template you can use. Um, and the OSF, the Open Science Framework, has an inclusive systematic review protocol form, which is available to be used across review types um, as well. Okay, so now that you have your protocol, where are we putting it? Which is a great question. Next slide, we have several options for where to register. And that depends on if there is a registry um, for your discipline, such as the Cochrane Library, which is a database for Cochrane studies, um, or you could use, um, there's other protocol registries that are more discipline specific. If there isn't one for you that is discipline specific, the Open Science Framework is your catch all for other protocol registries. It is recommended to put your protocol in a protocol registry. However, publishing your protocol in a institutional repository, a funder repository, or within preprint servers are also acceptable. 
the main point is that it is published before you begin forming the rest of your research. Okay, now on the next slide, we'll start going over the systematic review process. Finally, right? All right. So we like this little arrow that shows you the steps involved in a systematic review. Um, we already talked about preparation a lot. So everything that we were talking about before, forming your question, maybe using a framework to form the question, um, determining what guidelines and protocols you're gonna use, that's all part of the preparation work. So we don't need to get into that again. We already talked about it. Um, I thought it was interesting. Uh, one of the uh, lib guides that Clarissa and I like um, from UNC, their UN, it's the UNC Systematic Review uh, Library Guide, maps out how long the whole systematic review process takes and then each of the different parts. And the whole process, they state, takes uh, 1,168 hours. So that's that's all of this, right? Um, but again, we already talked about preparation, so we're going to jump into retrieval. So this is when you're actually doing the searching, right? Um, this step of the process, again, according to UNC, takes uh, more than 40 hours. And everything I'm talking about here, just remember, um, it's essential to document everything. So of course, I already kind of went over that, but um, remember each step in the retrieval process, you're also gonna wanna document. Uh, so one of the first things you may wanna do are uh, is to put a call out to your listserv um, in your discipline area or any known researchers um, about, about your research. Um, and they can help in a number of different ways, but one of which is if you don't already have seed articles, they can also be called gold standard articles or sentinel articles, um, engaging your uh, the other researchers in your discipline can help um, make these apparent. So these articles um, are those that you identified in your preliminary searches. They may be the ones that kind of led you down this research path in the first place. Um, and you want to use seed articles for a couple different reasons. One is to gather terminology that you'll then use in your searches to gather keywords, search terms, et cetera. And two, you'll want to check that these seed articles are included in your search results. That's one of the ways that you can test that your search is comprehensive enough. If the seed article, the you know, sort of like the main article in your in this research area isn't included, that means you're going to have to um, adjust your search strategy, right? So um, talking to other researchers in your discipline can give you some ideas for seed articles. You may already know them, um, but you do want to sort of engage that community. It can be helpful. Um, and then in terms of identifying the search concepts and terms um, for each concept, uh, it's helpful to think, well, you'll need to think, it's necessary, I guess, to think really critically about your search terms. So this is another area where um, using a framework can help. Something like PICO can help you identify the main um, components, the main concepts in your question, right? In your, in your, yeah, in your question. Um, using keywords um, can help broaden your search, right? Because you'll use um, keywords and then synonyms for those keywords. And this is actually another, not another, but this is one place where I think um, generative AI like ChatGPT can be really helpful in coming up with those synonyms. So you can, you probably know some synonyms right off the bat, um, but you want to use all synonyms. Um, and sometimes, you know, you might not know all of them, but um, using something like ChatGPT, I think can be helpful here in coming up with your, your search terms, your keywords. Um, and then you'll want to combine keywords with index terms or subject headings, um, which will help focus your search by refining it. Only those articles that have been tagged 
um, either by an indexer or by an author as being part of that subject. So your keywords and your synonyms broaden the search, and then the using index index terms and subject headings um, is going to help um, make your search more precise. Um, and then you'll combine key uh, keywords and index terms with your Boolean and proximity operators. Um, and then this combination is going to help make your search really specific. Um, you'll start, and then again, you need to kind of do that for every concept in your in your question, right? Um, and there can be multiple, it's a, if it's a long question, there can be like, you know, three, four, five, six different concepts or more. Um, so this part is, is pretty intense. This is an intense part of the process. Um, and then you'll want to start with one database. You'll analyze the results from searching in that one database. Um, you'll choose the best database for your research question. Um, this is where, again, talking to other researchers in your discipline area can help. Um, but you will need to search multiple databases. So you'll start with kind of the best, maybe your go-to, um, but you'll need to search, you'll need to run the search across many different databases because databases all index different journals. Um, and then again, if your seed articles aren't included, um, you'll need to refine your search. And then, once you're running your search, to run the search in multiple databases, you do need to translate your search often. You'll often need to translate it from database to database. Um, that can be tricky, especially outside of um, health sciences, um, as other as databases in other disciplines aren't always like very well set up to do this. Um, and then you also want to keep in mind that you need to document the instance of the database that you're using. So for example, you can access the database PsycInfo via Ovid or sometimes via ProQuest. Um, and each of those instances may be a little different. So that's something that's important to include in your documentation. Um, so for example, if you were doing the research uh, from AU, we have um, our PsycInfos through Ovid. So you would wanna make sure that you include that information. And then you also wanna be aware of the terms that you're using to describe your search strategy. So for example, Web of Science is actually a platform. The database is Web of Science core collection. So you're not searching Web of Science, you're searching Web of Science core collection, right? So you do wanna be careful with your terms. And again, that's to ensure that your search strategy is replicable. Um, we do have, Oh, and of course, I pointed out in the chat, on average, it's, I don't know if that was for the whole process or just search, but on average, they, that the average, but they can be much longer. That's exactly right. Um, so I wanted to show you just kind of what a search strategy document can look like. Um, this research question in particular is, what is the evidence that 360 degree feedback contributes to improved employee performance compared to standard feedback methods? So looking at this particular type of um, employee feedback, right? Um, we've identified our seed articles here, and then we've identified the first database we're going to look at is Business Force Premier. This is, um, you know, one of the big uh, databases that index uh, scholarly business journals. Kind of broken um, down the concept, and then again, generated keywords. Um, so some of these uh, we could think of ourselves, maybe you're using help to think of some others. Um, and then you'll want to find within this database the subject heading. There may not be one, but um, in this case, in this case there was. And then we can see the different search steps here. So our first search was we were searching um, our subject was 300, sorry, our subject heading was 365 degree feedback. It's within that subject heading. And that might have just been subject, not subject heading. The next search, we're searching within title. So we're limiting, limiting our search to titles. Um, we're kind of uh, broadening this up. We're using synonyms for that original concept. Um, and then we're using within four, so N4 of um, these concepts, right? So the proximity operator in Business Source Premier is N4. 
but it's going to be different in different databases. Um, and then our next search is we're searching our abstracts for the same search. We're doing the same search, but this time searching the abstracts, right? Instead of the titles that should be, be presumably broader. Um, and the next search is we're doing the first search or the second search or the third search, right? Um, and we'd be keeping track of how many results come in for each of these. Step four should be the broadest because it's combining the first three. Um, and then you would want to repeat using the different parts of your, like the different parts of the search concepts, right? Um, you could do the same for, uh, you could search title and then abstract and then title and abstract, sorry, title or abstract. And then you'd combine four step and the seven step. So it, it's a lot, right? It's um, a lot of really like in-depth searching. Um, and then you would have to do the same thing, but translate it to another database. In this case, let's say PsychInfo. Um, so it's gonna look a little bit different. So instead of TI colon, we can search title or abstract, right? It's just a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, let me go back to my slides. So that's what it can, that's what it can look like. And then moving on in our retrieval process, um, after doing database searching, um, you're going to want to hand search. So this involves manually searching the table of contents of important journals, reference lists, bibliographies, et cetera. Um, so it is important to hand search in addition to doing database searching, um, since not all databases index all journals, and sometimes an index term is not correctly applied. Um, so you may be missing things because they weren't indexed correctly. Um, hand searching is somewhat related to searching the gray literature. So gray literature is literature which is published outside of commercial publishing. So we want to think um, conference proceedings. Uh, some people consider government documents great literature. Some people don't. Uh, theses and dissertations. Um, and this is an important step because you want to make sure your results aren't biased away from null findings, right? Um, null findings may not be published, but they are still part of the body of research that needs to be included in a systematic review. Um, and you're often not really gonna find those in a database, right? Um, and in addition, uh, something like 50% of conference proceedings are never published. Um, so there's a lot of information there. And gray literature searching is really important, um, I think particularly in qualitative studies, um, especially those that are looking at un underrepresented groups who may have been left out of, traditionally left out of, and still left out of um, commercial publishing. Um, you'll want to save your searches so you can update them. There's different methods to updating your search. Um, most of these are pretty database specific, uh, but really you just want to avoid having to rescreen all of the same results all over again. Um, some databases will allow you to filter by date added to the database, not date published, but date added. Um, but these tend to be health science databases. And um, into our other disciplines, we don't see that quite as often. And then finally, before you start um, the appraisal process, the screening process, you wanna dedupe your results. So you can do that in a citation manager or something like Zotero um, or some systematic review specific tools, something like Covenance um, uh, will also dedupe. Okay, and now we're on to article screening. Okay, now that you found all the articles and you only have one of each of them, it's time to evaluate all of them. So this is the like appraisal article screening process. What you'll do is you're going to be screening every single study that you found um, against your eligibility criteria, what is included and what is excluded. Um, this is also part of why it's important to have three or more researchers, two people make a decision and somebody's there for a tiebreaker. Um, it's recommended to start with um, a piloting or an establishing round where you look at 10 to 20 articles, decide yes, no, or maybe. 
um, one person says yes, another person says yes, that's an easy, it'll move on to the next stage. One person says no, one person says yes. It's time for a discussion about why one would or would not meet that eligibility criteria. Um, doing that helps establish your inter-researcher um, agreement level. Um, and it clarifies the eligibility before you go through and start looking at all of the documents. Um, so once you do that little trial period, you are going to go through and look at all of the documents. All you'll be doing is looking at titles and abstracts. And if it has the inclusion or exclusion criteria, you will say yes, no, or maybe. Um, if there is a disagreement, it goes on to a tiebreaker stage. Maybes move on with the yeses into the next stage, which is the full text screening, where you will go through and read the full text of every article to determine if it does continue to meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria. While doing this whole process, you will be tracking your decisions for reporting, and you will be tracking that through the Prisma flowchart or some other document. Um, once you've gathered all of your included studies, it's time to appraise the um, evidence. So once you have all of them and they're all definitely yeses, you still want to make sure that overarching they meet your criteria for relevance, reliability, validity, and applicability. And once again, these are all criteria that would have been decided ahead of time. Um, once you have all of that, it's time to perform a risk of bias assessment for all of your included studies. There are multiple tools that will help you perform this risk of bias assessment. Um, you will choose a assessment tool that matches what type of study you'll be seeing. Um, for example, randomized controlled type, um, study versus like qualitative. So there's different tools for that. Um, and that's how you'll appraise it in a nutshell. This is part of the like longest part of the process is going through and appraising everything. Next, you're muted. <laughs> Next step after appraising is um, synthesizing uh, all the data that you've collected. Um, so one way you can do this is by uh, you know you want you can map it to tables. Uh, you can develop an evidence table which gives detailed summaries for each of the included studies. Um, and then a summary table that's like a high level overview of the findings. Um, and these tables may, they may be described like the characteristics of the studies, the results, um, or both. And they can help you determine if the studies are available um, or are usable rather for a quantitative analysis, if they're sufficiently similar. Um, you do want to have at least two people um, reviewing it, and again, appraising and then extracting the data. Um, this is another step um, where you could use a tool like Providence that uh, in, you can use it to create an extraction template um, to perform dual and single reviewer data extraction, uh, review extractions for consensus, uh, export the extractions, and consensus. Um, of course, you can also use something like Excel and Qualtrics too, um, but one of those like Schematic review specific tools would probably have more automating involved. Um, you extract the data that's relevant to your study. So you can always use a framework to help you think about this. Again, going back to your, your question um, or look at other systematic reviews to see what they extracted. That can be helpful as well. Um, you may want to include information about the article, author, the title, date of publication, the DOI, information about the study, uh, the type of study, how the participants were recruited, the level of evidence, participant demographics, the interventions, the outcomes, again, depending on how your question was set up. Um, if the studies are sufficiently similar, you can do a meta-analysis 
which is a statistical approach to synthesizing the results from multiple studies. Um, but if the results are not similar, if they're too heterogeneous, whether because of varying studying designs um, or et cetera, um, then you would wanna do a narrative or a descriptive analysis. Um, and there's no one process for this, for a narrative or descriptive analysis, it really varies. All right, and then finally, the easy part, you just get to write it all up. Um, so some advice when writing the article is make sure you are referencing your reporting standards, because once again, these reporting standards tell you explicitly what you need to be including when writing. There are also plenty of systematic review writing resources, such as chapter 15 of the Cochrane Handbook, and our favorite Prisma has a statement that came out in 2020 about writing. Um, when writing your article, make sure you have updated and finished your Prisma flow diagram that can be included either within your article or as an appendix or supplemental. And then you're also going to prepare your search strategies for a publication that will be in your appendix or supplement. So all of your search strategies aren't going to go in your method section, but they should be available somewhere once again for that repli replicability of your study. You're going to include every single step that you did for all of your research in some sort of supplemental document. Right. So that's a process, right? Easy peasy. Um, let's talk about some tools. Um, so unfortunately, there is no one tool to manage the entirety of the systematic review process. There are tools for uh, searching and developing a search strategy. There are tools for managing the information and there's screening tools. There's also tools to help you find a tool where I'm gonna start. Um, systematicreviewtools.com can help you find a tool for whatever step of the systematic review process. And then SR Accelerator um, lists free tools for every step of the way. For your search and search strategy, um, one tool is Citation Chaser. Um, and I should mention a lot of these use R or like R applications. So you are comfortable using R, um, that's probably going to be helpful. Uh, citation Chaser automates uh, forward and backward citation, citation searching. Um, and then List Searcher uh, helps with term harvesting, um, so generating some of your keywords and, and synonyms. Uh, it also helps with Boolean search construction and testing searches against seed studies. Um, and then depending on what your question is, there are also some PubMed specific tools as well. Um, for managing the information, one tool uh, that is used quite a bit is Zotero, which is a citation manager. Um, uh, and then you can use Zotero in combination with several like our applications to um, help you dedupe. Uh, there's one called Automated Systematic Search Deduplicator. Um, you don't have to use Zotero. You can also use like an EndNote or Mendeley. Um, the AU library is best equipped to help with Zotero, um, but it's not the it's not the only tool out there. And then screening tools um, would include Covidence, which I mentioned previously, uh, that was created specifically for systematic reviews. In, in addition to uh, Distiller SR, um, both of these do require a subscription. And then there's uh, Rayan, which is also pretty popular and free. Um, SysRev is a newer tool for that you can use for data extraction and screening, and it is highly customizable. The free version is supposed to be pretty good. Uh, the paid for version uh, is probably gonna be a little better. Um, at this point, the AU library does not subscribe to Covidence or Distiller SR, um, but Covidence is what I looked last week, so it should be pretty pretty up to date. Uh, Covidence is $240 for one systematic review and up to three collaborators. Okay. 
And of course, I'll just put all of these links in the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Felissa. And now um, let's talk about where the library can, can help out. Um, so we are planning to pilot a systematic review um, consultation service in fall of 2023. We are currently working on creating a toolkit and a subject guide um, that will pair with this consultative service. Uh, we hope to have those available this summer before we launch in the fall. So at this point, um, where we're going to be able to help would be understanding the processes and steps involved in evidence synthesis or specifically a systematic review. Um, determine if there are existing reviews, help you define or refine your topic, um, help you develop and register your protocol. We can help you identify relevant databases where you want to be searching and then review some of those search um, techniques. Um, currently, we're unable to help with doing the actual searches or formally writing up um, the search section for your manuscript. Um, these types of servants would generally warrant um, co-authorship for a librarian helping, um, but at this point, we are just not staffed to be able to offer help out with those services. Um, so I think I'm gonna turn it over to Clarissa to wrap it up quickly. All right, great. Um, thank you, Katie, and thank you for everyone who came and for your attention. Um, this was our first presentation to faculty about systematic reviews, and we're so excited to look forward and to start offering this consultative service. In the meantime, there is a survey for CTRL for you to fill out in the chat as well as please ask us any of your questions that you have. I think we can make these slides available, right, Katie? Yeah. Um, in addition, if you are currently performing a um, systematic review or you're thinking about one, we are looking for guinea pigs for our systematic review consultative service pilot. Um, please feel free to follow up with us about that as well um, so we can discuss that. Does anyone who has done uh, a systematic review, want to talk about the process? Um, how did you find it? Any wisdom to share? If you don't, if you don't want to, do, but I'm just curious. Oh, interesting. Okay. That's very cool. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you, Anna, for giving us co-author or co-host abilities. Give us a presentation. And I guess if there's no questions, we can end a little early. Oh, yeah, great. Okay, okay. Excellent. But yes, if there's if there are no questions, um, I would say feel free to hop off and have 20 minutes of your day back.